He says, I struggled hard. I don't know what to struggle hard with. But everywhere you have struggled hard, maybe it's in life, maybe it's your health, maybe it's childbirth. In the name of the Lord Jesus, begin to win. He said, this is Naphtali. I prophesy over you this year, you will bring your Naphtali. You will declare that where I struggled hard, I am winning. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we thank you. Thank you Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Help me say hello to someone on your right and your left and have your seat. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So this morning and this month, you understand in our church, this month we take a topic every month and this month we're starting with our new teaching, which is our family month. So our teaching is going to focus a lot on marriage and relationship because this is our family month. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. And let me say something quickly here. One of the things the teaching does, so the reason why we teach this is very powerful. Um, one of the things the teaching really does for us is this. The teaching has a way to remind you of the things you know, to inspire you to do the things you know, to make the adjustment on what you know, and give you fresh insights that you were never aware of before. Let me use my example. Glory to God. How many of you know what this is? I know a lot of ladies don't know what this is, but most men know what this is. Do you know what this is? What is the name? What? It's a wheel spanner. It's in every car, literally. I'm sure it's in your car, even though you don't know you have one, ladies. You know, and you know, and this is what the wheel spanner does. Very powerful thing. When you drive your car, if you're not careful, after some time, you will notice that every car tire is attached to the car with a nut. Have you noticed that? There's a knot. There are about four or five knots on every tire. And when you drive your car, actually when you drive in Africa where the roads are not so good, what happens with some time, the knot begins to what? Get loose. Get loose. And how do you know the knot is getting loose? When you start driving, the car will begin to shake. You will feel this shaking sensation when you drive. And if you're a very smart driver, you will just go to the tires and say, what's wrong with my tires? One of the first things you will just do is to check down the knot. And if you find the knot is loose, what do you do? You just take the spanner and what? You tighten the knot. Why does the knot get loose? Did you do something wrong that the knot got loose? No, it's just normal wear and tear. What this teaching does to you is very powerful. As you go through life as a single person, as you go through life as married, there are mentalities and there are values that begin to get loose. When you come into teaching, what we do is to put it there and we, what? we begin to tighten it. There are some things you believe right now that are beginning to shake you. You begin to tighten it. So someone say, marriage is not worth it. But that was not how you were thinking two years ago. You've got, your knot is loose. We need to what? tighten it. A single person says that there are no good men again. That was not the way you were thinking two years ago. Life happened to you and has affected your mindset. So we need to what? Tighten it. You say, all men as comes. That was not what you were thinking before. You've gotten somewhere else. We need to what? Begin to what? Tighten it. So in this teaching, it's going to be a lot of us looking at where it's loose and begin to tighten it. Are you ready for the journey? Glory to God. Can you help me with this? Are you ready for the journey? Glory to God. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 12 in verse, one, in verse 2. Matthew chapter 12 in verse 2. I will read in the King James and further go forward to read in the message translation. Matthew chapter 12 in, sorry, Romans chapter 12, not Matthew. Romans chapter 12 in verse 2. Romans chapter 12 in verse 2. The Bible says this, and this is very instructive. It says, and be not conformed to this world. So that means that for he to say, if I say, watch your steps, what does that mean? For me to say, watch your steps, that means the tendency for you to fall is actually very high. So when he says, be not conformed to the world, it means that there's a high tendency for you to what? To be conformed to the world. What does this mean? He says, do not conform to the world. And you get conformed to the world in your thinking. And in this particular teaching, we're looking at how people are conformed to the world when it comes into the issues of relationships and issues of marriage. Because we, we are, let me tell you something, a lot of us think that we are making choices. We are not really making those choices. Those choices were suggested to us from a subminial level and we are making those choices. We are saying that this is my preference. This is not your preference. It's the fact that there's a lot of suggestions on your mind that makes you feel as if this is a preference you want. Praise the Lord. You know, I, I, I was, there's a, there's a, 
there's a marketing technique I read online, and it, I found it amazing. And it happens, you know, and there will be these stands that dispense soft drinks. Most of the time, it will be Pepsi or Coke. And they say, do you know when they stand dispensing soft drinks, that when they stand dispensing soft drinks, it sells maybe about 20%. It says, if you put another brand of drinks there, so this stand dispenses soft drinks, sells, is a, is a vending machine, sells Coke. If you now put a Fanta machine there, you will expect that the sales of the Coke will drop. Yes or no? But in marketing, what they notice that the, 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 what, the, the sales of the Coke doubles. You know why? Because now they condition your mind that you have two choices. When you have one choice, you're like, okay, I will get it some other places. But it conditions your mind that you have two choices. And what has happened to us over time is this. We have values, we have behaviors that the media and prevailing culture of thinking has heavily influenced. So you hear single people say things like, who do you want to marry? I want a guy that is tall, dark, and handsome. Where did you get that from? There's nothing about tall, dark, and handsome that makes him a good husband. It can be taught that can handsome and be a total idiot. Praise God. And that's why when you marry taught that can handsome and you wonder why is he not a good husband, you were not looking for good husband. You were looking for tall, dark, and handsome. And what did you get? You got what? Tall, dark, and handsome. But the culture tells you that if you want a great marriage, all you need is what? Tall, dark, and handsome. Ask yourself, why they, what do you want to use tall, dark, and handsome for? You don't need a tall man, you need a tolerant man. Praise God. I said praise God. But subconsciously, the culture tells us that. And that's what the Bible says, and be not conformed to this world. The way it affects us is that in a very sublimal level, in a very sublimal level, you know, for example now, i give you a good example. G-Wagon used to be a terrible, ugly car nobody used to drive. Many years ago. But... They went through some branding and repackaging. And even till now, g wagon is quite a difficult car to still drive. Because you can't really relax. It's not just configured that way. But g wagon went through some branding and it became a premium car. And all of a sudden, g wagon is now a premium car. But 20 years ago, g wagon wasn't that way. And I'm saying so to you because some of the things you think, it's normal for you to think this way, it's normal for you to want this, it's normal for you to say this, are things that the culture has done to you and you did not think about it very well. And now it's become your natural, it's now become your natural taste. I remember when they were trying to convince us to eat Indomie. Some of you were born to know Indomie. I remember I was not born to know Indomie. I knew when Indomie came with an aggressive marketing. And, you know, people say it was worms. I don't know if you ever heard that theory that it was worms. But ultimately, because of marketing, our mind doesn't even think of Indomie that way again. I mean, it's okay to eat poison once in a while. Praise the Lord. Yeah, because I, I don't know why you want to wait. What, everything is just plastic and chemicals. There's no real food in it. Glory to God. So the Bible says, and be not conformed to this world. So all of a sudden, we move from people that couldn't eat Indomie. Those days, when you left Indomie, children will run away from it. They were like, what is this? What is this? Don't away. But it, we move from that to become a generation that is not an Indomie generation. And what happened is that suggestions preventing thinking alter the way we think. So the Bible begins to warn us here. He said, be not conformed to this world. I mean, have you not noticed that I, 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 I'm not... I, I'm a, I can't sell people in marriage. I can't sell single people. I hear the most ridiculous things. One of the ridiculous things I hear is that I broke up with him, my boyfriend. Why? He doesn't give me girlfriend allowance. I said, what do you mean by that? What girlfriend allowance? You know, it says when you're dating a girl, then every month you, 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 know, you give her some amount of money. Pretend as if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Pretend. And, and to some of you, it makes perfect sense because of your economic reality. But the reason why God is warning us and be, and you want to judge a man if he's good or not, you know, because he's giving boyfriend allowance. He said, be not conformed to this world. I'm not saying that don't take care of her if you have the resources, but you need to know your responsibility does not start when you are dating. Your responsibility starts when you are married. You can practice responsibility in dating, but your responsibility starts in marriage. I know it's difficult to clap. I understand that. But the reason why it's difficult to clap is because 
know, because I dated my wife, who were, you know, we dated for years, and there was no girlfriend allowance. So when you say it, you know, when, when you say, I want to say we dated for years, I mean, well, at, well, for like three or four years we were together. Three or four years. And there was no girlfriend. Because the thing is that this thing about girlfriend allowance, it's quite new, maybe in the last 10 years. He says, and be not conform to the world. So I'm saying to you that there, there are things that you have slipped in and you have never considered that, okay, these things that's really affecting me, what is it? Is it what is real or is not real? Is it not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the meaning of your mind? Look at what the Amplified Bible says here. And the, the message translation. Message translation. Very powerful. Very powerful. So before you know it, your taste is different. So all of a sudden, you want someone that gives all of these things or does all of these things. And you're wondering, why do I have this taste? The reason why you have this taste is that carefully you've been shipped by social media. You've been shipped by marketing. You're, you've been shipped that way. See what the Bible says here. Very powerful. It says, I'm, I'm reading from verse 2, verse 2 is in the middle. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without thinking. That's what I'm going to. It says, your culture is so strong, you just fit in without thinking. It says, don't become so adjusted to your culture that you fit in without thinking. For example, sometimes when I see what people went to church, I'm like, culture is so strong. You can wait, talk to church as a leader, as a city, show your stomach. Mm -mm. It's the house of God. You wear a top, it says a crop top to church during praise and worship. You now do, we lift up our hands, and everybody in front of you distracted. Hey, you don't market what you don't want to sell, though. If you market, that means you want to sell. Don't send the wrong signal. Praise God. And I'm saying so because some of you are like, what's wrong with that? You know, you fitted into the culture so well that you don't even know that something is wrong with that. See what the Bible says. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you can fit into it without even thinking. And that's what I'm going to today. So today, we're going to ask ourselves some questions and say, hey, these are the things to believe about marriage. And, you know, and, and just to let you know, the people that influence us about marriage the most are people that are from Hollywood, are social media influencers. Some of them have never been married before and they have their own kids. I'm not teaching them. I'm just saying what it is. Some of them have been married four or five times before and they're the people that are a role model in marriage. Meanwhile, the Word of God gives us a guideline towards marriage. Someone say hallelujah. Someone say Hallelujah. So we have a lot of impression. Marriage will make you happy. That's not from the Bible. If you're not happy as a single person, you can't be married as a married. If you're not happy as a single person, you can be happy as what? As a married person. Before, before marriage makes you happy to kill you first. Before you will have to die in marriage. The people that have good marriages are people that are dead to their own needs. And they've learned over time to prioritize somebody else's needs. So when people think of marriage, you know, you know, have you noticed in marriages, when you see pictures online and videos about marriages, the couples are always on the beach, they are never in traffic. They're always on the beach with shorts, the lady, the lady never, the lady is never out of shape, she's always slim, you know, with all this like singlet kind of top with, you know, with a nice bum at the back, and the guy will be tall and just holding and say, you were my African prince. Get love my dreams, get love my dreams, get love my dreams. And that's what it is. But that is a Hollywood kind of marriage. In real marriage, we stay in traffic. In real marriage, men have body odor. In real marriage, when you want to kiss in the morning, the mouth will stink. Have you noticed in movies, their mouth doesn't stink in the morning? They just go like, oh baby, oh, mwah, 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 mwah. And you know what I'm saying? So, so you have this expectation of marriage that when you marry, every time I look at my husband, next to my husband, next to baby, mwah, mwah. so you marry and you turn aside and the guy says, oh, oh, and say, oh, Jesus. 
Glory to God. I said glory to God. Because the thing is that there's what culture suggests to you that this is that they say, ah, fine girls, girls that are slim, that, you know, that, that said that the bomb is this here. And that's what's making cosmetic surgery sell. Because culture tells that this is what the beautiful girl, so we must use bleaching cream. We must do big BL because this is what is selling right now. So even the Christian brothers are looking for what is selling and body does not determine how successful your marriage will be. Praise God. If you put more attention on your character, you will have a better marriage than putting more attention on doing BBL. You go to Turkey and take $20,000 and do your butt and do your breast. Can you take some time and fix this you're talking that you talk anyhow? Glory to God. I said glory to God. He says, he says, see what it says here. He said, do not become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into without even thinking. Man, where did you get this new thing from? You, are, you, you, you know, man, you have a house, you put your special mistress. There's a special house that you and your friends, the things I've heard in the last one week about Lagos, Jesus, they had, they had to upgrade me. This is some people, if they don't pee on the gate, they can't get hard. Some people, if it's not two people, two girls at the same time, if it's not two girls at the same time, you are not okay. You are not okay, oh. And let me tell you something. When do we go from those kind of people to this? What happens is that we are just fitting into prevailing thinking and culture. Because you went to the office and your friend, your friend said, ah, he said, ah, man, this well, you know, I, I had Latasha. And he said, ah, Lat me, I do two or three. And I said, hmm, the new standard is two or three. Now you have a fresh desire for two or three. And this is what it means when it says that do not become so well adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without thinking. You say that, ah, my wife is not good in sex compared to what? My wife doesn't make noise compared to what? Okay, where is it in the Bible that they should be loud? Okay, they should make noise. What's the volume in the Bible? Is it five or ten? The reason why is that, the reason why is that this is what is killing Because we have all these things that's programmed us that for sex to be nice, it must be like it was with Lucy when you were losing it all together. That's what, now you are married to the born again girl. You're like, oh, you know, and she has her own expressions and she should be expressive, that's what I'm saying. But when you say she's not loud, compared to what? Because in our minds, the world has given us a definition of how sex should be. And we have bought it and it's affecting our expectation from sex. So your mind that has no problem, you are putting marriage there because of the expectation that you brought inside. Praise God. My man does not last. Last. It doesn't last. Is it the everlasting one? I want to ask you, what is the definition of last? And many of us also know that we are bringing this expectation from where we were before. So you come into marriage and you are deeply frustrated. You are deeply, deeply frustrated. And that's the challenge of having too many sexual partners before you get married. You have a sexual variety that you, all of a sudden you begin to expect from Sister Mary Jane. And that's why born again people, when they come to church, they don't find the Christian sisters. Blah, blah, blah. The reason why is that this one, that's him. Blah, blah, blah. Ah, can she? Ah. <laughs> ah. Ah. I don't want someone that will fold my hand. Though. Ah. I want someone that will take all level. You know, so, so you now get married and now want to turn her to a sister. Marriage is not the place you alter people. Is the place you build people. So I want to say hallelujah. But what I'm saying is this, and I'm, I'm saying so because I'm, I'm telling you, some guys will say things like, ah, uh, all the girls, all the girls nowadays, it's money, they, why are you not married? Ah, the girls are too expensive. Date your size. 
The problem is you. You have not found your size to date. I'm not saying girls are not expensive, but that's their problem. You as a man, date your size. So he said, I'm trying to make more money to date them. Listen, if you date that person, you will date a budget. And you will not have peace. The reason why is that you need to learn how to date what? Your size. So stop using men as a, stop using women as, a, as an excuse why you're not married. Date your size. Hallelujah. Let's read the scripture again. Is it, don't become so adjusted to culture that you fit into it without what? Even thinking. Instead, fix your eyes on God. You will be changed from inside out. Really recognize what, let's keep going, what he wants from you and you will quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you that is always dragging you down to his level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you, develops wealth for maturity in you. It's that the culture around you is always bringing you down. Whatever you are not selling, you don't market. So single people, if you keep showing boobs and breasts and cleavages, you will attract people that look like those kind of things. And that shows us what you're selling. The thing is that if you attract a guy by showing boobs, what do you think will sustain him? You will not say that, ah, he doesn't like church. Was it church that brought him? Because the idea is that I can change him, which is one of the biggest mistakes in marriages. So let's go, let's go. So in this teaching, we want to understand from the Bible, Christ's purpose for marriages and we want to speak into forgiveness as we round this up. And those right state of emotions that we should be. Glory to God. Why is purpose important? If I'm traveling to the UK and it's winter, I will get what? I will get winter jackets. The reason why is that I'm preparing for where I'm traveling to. If you don't know the purpose of marriage, you will choose wrong. Because purpose determines your choice. So if you think, so purpose determines your choice. And if you're married, what marriage does for you as a married person is that if you know the purpose of marriage, it will help you to be enduring. It will help you to be changing because you know that this is the reason why I'm married. One of the first purpose for marriage. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 in the Amplified Version. The first purpose for marriage. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. And the Lord said, it's not good for man to be what? Alone. And if you want to be married, you must learn to share your loneliness. And that's what is for me. Because I grew by myself and I love that space. He says the next thing, and I will make him what? What? I will make him a helper. So the woman is a helper. Yeah. So listen, woman, when you get married, you came to help. You came to do work. Not vacation. Walk. Not kata. Walk. Not LV. Walk. Do you have a helper in your house? You came to help. The reason why is that some things, some wives complain about, you need to back up and ask them, excuse me, why did you get married? I was watching a video recently and a fight broke out and what broke out in the fight? It was in a place of argument that the husband discovered that the wife had tied her womb since they got married. She had tied her troops. So the husband had been going from hospital to hospital, hospital, hospital thinking he's the one that has the problem. She did not know that the wife had said, I don't want to carry baby. And the wife let her to be going. I'm not saying you cannot tie your tubes, but can we have a conversation? The reason why is that Marriage comes at benefit, at cost. So just imagine that lady. She wants to enjoy marriage, but there are some responses that come to marriage she doesn't want to take. Just like some men. I know men that will drink, men that will sponsor girls, but yet will not pay school fees for their children. That's totally irresponsible. What, was it? what makes you a man? 
God makes you a man is that you're responsible. You can pay the fees. You can take care of the house. As much as is within your capacity. So see what the Bible says in the purpose of marriage. He says, I will make him a helper. Let's read the next line together. I want to go. Oh, hold on. Let's read together. I want to go. I, you know, this scripture is blessing me. It's blessing me. The reason why is that marriage complements you. So most of the time when you marry, you find someone that balances the weaknesses that you have. So have you noticed in marriage, you hardly have to talk as. There's always a talker and there's what? A listener. The reason why is that, it's even from the dating period, you see the problem. Because when the two talkers go on dates, ah, when she comes back, ah, I, do you like, how was the date? Ah, I, I, man, that guy talks a lot. And the reason why she says he talks a lot was because she had a lot to say that she could not say. She too was a talker. So it was a battle of the titans. Who can talk more? So as soon as she said, eh, so how are you? He said, um, I was even thinking, yes, uh -huh. that's what I was thinking about. And she will finish the question for her. The girl said, let me talk. And I said, yes. He said, that I wanted to talk, but I wanted to also hear this. And it's two talkers. So most of the time, when a talker goes out with a listener, the comeback is powerful. You know what they say is beautiful? Because why the listener is wondering, what will I say? The talker will ask the question. Answer the question. Ask another question. Answer the question. And they say, I thank God for this guy. I love his conversations. Why? He says, I will make him a helper. One that what? Balances him out. Most of the time, when you are a spender, you marry a saver. And most of the time, when you are a saver, you marry what? A spender. That's what happens. Most of the time, most of the time, when you are very organized, you marry a disorganized person. <laughs> Why? And, and you know why this is important? And this, this is challenging because initially, the oppositeness attracts you, but it will make you fight. Because opposite is attractive from afar. When it comes close, it's very irritating and challenging. And what we need to do is this, either we're single or married is this, to begin to say that, okay, marriage is for complementation. This person is different from me. How do I see the strength in the difference and not the weakness in their difference? I don't know what, what, what's making them laugh right now. What's making them laugh right now? On, on the screen. That's great. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Why is it great to compliment? The reason why is that every strength comes with weakness. Every what? Strength comes with weakness. Every strength comes with weakness. Even the one that is a saver, it comes to weakness. You can oversave. All the savers are saying, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. Because you can be so annoying. You not be hiding money from your wife or husband. Every strength comes with weakness. Just like the one that is a good listener. That strength of listening comes to weakness. Because when it's time for you to talk, then you don't talk. You act as if you are deaf and dumb. Even people that are very, very beautiful physically is a weakness. So, you know why? Most of the time, and this is very powerful, this is a research. Most of the time when girls are very beautiful and they've been told that since when they were young, they don't have very strong character of person. Not all the time, most of the time. The reason why is that if what men compliment about is your physical beauty, you will invest more in it. You will not invest more in other qualities that you need in marriage. You will keep doing eyebrow, eyelids, eye, pink pencil, blue pencil, this and this. You know, because that's what people compliment about you. Glory to God. So what marriage does is this. The marriage gives you two full experiences. And you know the beauty of marriage is one that compliments you. Just with time, they will rub off on you. My wife is a fashionista. You know when you see my wife, she's wearing yellow today. My wife always has like all this, you know, way to wear things. You know, you know, the, the, one of the first gifts my wife gave me was six shirts. And you could tell the reason why she gave me those shirts, right? Because she looked at what I used to wear and it was just apologetic. 
when I was young, when I was when I was younger, you know, I used to dress. I thought that the definition of like, you know, um, classy, nice dressing is that the brighter, the more colorful, the better. So you just remember, I just wear yellow shirts, green trousers, brown tie. Ah, bude shata. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, you know, because I just said that when you just appear like this, dun, you just like traffic lights. No introduction. So my wife began to, you know, tell me this thing. But after some time, I said, leave me. Let me dress the way I want. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Compliment. Just like the way men and women are different. Men think about work. Women think about children and family. Men want to invest in their office. Women want to invest in the home. And what that does is that it gives a balance. It gives what? A balance. So the children you are raising know there's work and there's what? There's home. Most of the time, men are very strict. Women are more emotional. So women will connect with the children on a deeper level. Men don't talk too much. But when they need to set the kids straight, they set the kids straight. I don't know if you know this. When you're close to your mother, when you're close to your mother, you will get a lot of emotional support and feel loved. When you're close to your father, you get a lot of confidence. And that's why people that are not close to their father, or never have their father figure, one thing they struggle with often is confidence and self-esteem. And one of the challenges of being a single parent is that a single parent, most of the time, you oxidate between the two and the child never gets any of them. Because you want to be the father and you also want to be the mother. So I'm saying, what should I do as a single parent? You must put someone in the child's life that can also offer that to the child. Glory to God. The second reason for marriage, hallelujah. The second reason for marriage. So, so I'm saying this, the second reason for marriage is this. Marriage, marriage is, for, is, to, is for what? Character building. Marriage is for what? Character building. There's no way your Christian values be tested like marriage. There's no way what your Christian value will be tested like marriage. Maybe you can forgive you will find an offense partner. You will forgive until you are tired of forgiveness. Marriage will test your patience. Marriage will test everything testable in your Christianity. But the reason why that does that is because God uses marriage to build our character. You know what I'm saying? So, because this is not the Hollywood style of marriage I see. The kind of marriage I see right now is that, listen to me, if things go down, I'm out of here. That's not Christian marriage. Christian marriage, for better, for worse. Thank you. Thank you. Come and give me a hug. Come and give me a hug. <laughs> she stood up and just said, all of you online, you didn't catch the moment, but thank you. I deserve the hug. I'm preaching well. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. She couldn't take it and just stood up and said, Thank you, Pastor Bay. Glory to God. Marriage will teach you selflessness. Three things that affect marriage the most selfishness and ego. And you have people that have the combination of both with a PhD. Combination of both with the PhD. They always think they're always right. Marriage will teach you selflessness. Selflessness. Very powerful. Marriage will teach you selflessness. And the reason I'm saying so is this. Marriage is designed for, marriage is designed for sanctification, not just satisfaction. The reason why is that the way you see marriage now, you know, when you see marriage, you know, when you see marriages, people are always doing this, doing that, you know, all of those kinds. That's good, but that's not the only time for marriage. In marriage, there's going to be sanctification. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to streamline some things. And this is why people get divorced because they enter marriage and the reality of marriage dawns on them. And it tells them that this is not what I wanted. What I wanted as marriage was a life on a beach where I suntan every day 
I'm wearing bikini and pants. That's how women think of a marriage. And men think of a marriage about the, the kind of marriage I want is that I put her in the house and she does nothing. I come and I get a good meal and we have all the rounds of sex I want. Then I go back. I don't even have to talk to her. When I need sex, I just turn her on again. I say, uh-huh, a baby. And she says, oh yeah, baby is here. Ho oh, ho, come and get it. You know, and that's the definition. But in the real life, you know, you know, in movies, have you noticed they always feel like having sex actually? In real life, couples don't feel like having sex. In marriage, sex is a commitment. That's what only married people understand. Someone say hallelujah. 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 So how do you keep your marriage strong? How do you keep your marriage strong? How do you keep your marriage strong? Let me, ju let me just put this here. Number one, I mean, I said some on Wednesday. You can go and watch, and watch it. The, the, the other thing will be, what did I want to say is restrain. You must have restrain. You must have restraint. Relationship without restraint will become a war zone. Relationship without restraint will become what? A war zone. You must have restraint. There are things we do not do in this marriage. There are things we don't do in this relationship. Have you not seen the new culture? Eh? If you cheat, I cheat. Not only they cheat, all of us, they cheat together. If you cheat one, I cheat four. So that you will not say you are no big dollar. <laughs> Praise God. Restrain. What is restrain? There are some things we will not do. There are some words we will not say. Don't be the first person to bring negative words into your marriage. And anywhere there is no restraint in your relationship marriage, what will happen? It will become a war zone. Boundaries are like lines. We don't cross them. So every relationship must have boundaries. Without boundaries, marriage will become an abuse. Any relationship will become an abuse. So how do we keep marriage strong? There must be boundaries. There must be, you know, there must be some things we say. Some of you say things like, some boundaries people have simply said, we don't sleep except we settle the case. We don't sleep except we settle the case. If the case, if someone says, sir, if we don't talk for three days, then we go and say counselor. They are just, they're just things they say. We, no matter how bad it is, we never, and this is what we do, we never report our spouse to our, partner, to our parents, no matter what it is. Restrain. Restrain. Why do you think people talk about their money on social media? No restraint. And once you talk about the negative things in your life on social media, it will only amplify. Because people are not out for peace, they are out for war. Because once you resolve your marital crisis, then the news is over. The only way it's this on social media is that it's getting worse. So there's updates. So you now say, bang, 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 bang. Whiskey said this. David said this. This is what they are saying now. This best friend of this person said this. You now say, aha. We now start following your story because we also love war. You will now use your marital failure to be feeding and sponsoring social media blockers. Restrain. What is restrain? No matter what happens, I'm not talking to my ex. How do you talk? How do you keep close to an ex you were sleeping with and you were a married man? What happened to your mind and brain? You say, we're just friends. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. What do you put this cause? How can a responsible man be reporting his wife to his ex? And you expect to get godly biblical answer that will correct and feed your soul. You're thinking, eh? Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me close with this. Oh, wow. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 and 22.
So how do we build healthy marriages? Number one, do what? Restrain. All of you that are single, this one person. Singles, please. This one at a time. You get why? <laughs> Hallelujah. Matthew 18 verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against man and forgive him? And he said to what? Seven times. Peter said seven times. Verse 22. And Jesus said, seven times. One, two, five. I said, okay, no. Until seven times, but until 70 times what? Se seven. What just guys saying? Jesus is saying, if you're going to have a healthy relationship, you must learn to forgive. Two people you must forgive. You must forgive yourself. The reason why is that until you forgive yourself, you can't forgive other people. So you said that I had the divorce. I can't for you must forgive yourself. If you cannot forgive yourself, you can't forgive other people. And some of you, that's why you're stuck. You can't even forgive yourself. You had a child outside wedlock. You're a single mom right now. You, you're divorced. You, you, you made some mistakes. Hey, can you forgive yourself? The second thing is that, can you forgive the other person? And the reason why is that until you forgive yourself, there's no other person you can forgive. And Peter asked Jesus, how many times did I forgive? And he said, 70, Psalm 70. What forgiveness is one of the biggest gifts you can ever give yourself. Because until you forgive, you put yourself in a cage. Unforgiveness is drinking poison, hoping that your enemy will die. And let me say this quickly here. In my study of people that have not been able to marry, either they are divorced or they are single, one of the major things I notice are people that they hold in their heart a relationship that did not work out. And they don't know that somehow that begins to affect them and that's why they can't go ahead. You will see a lady and you just talk, 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 talk. You're still single. Yeah, what happened? I just say, okay, 10 years ago. I mean, this is the belief try story. He said, 10 years ago, I met this guy. We dated for five years. One day, just walked out. He said, I forgive you anymore. But ah, you have not forgiven him. Stop saying what his Christian is. The reason why is that, you see, until you forgive, you are not free. If you're going to get married and stay happy in marriage, there are commitments to forgive. And let me tell you why you must forgive. Just remember that you two are not perfect. But you understand your own failures. But you don't understand your partner's failures. Question, forgive. Some of you, you knew your father's... All your father's escapade, you knew it and you understood it. You may never agree, you understood it. You didn't make your mother sad. Your husband has not even done all to half. Only that he does not talk well, yet you can't forgive. I'm not saying tolerate a cheating partner, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you can understand your father's own, you can have the capacity to understand. This guy that is not doing well in his communication, in his behavior, why can't you extend the same forgiveness to the person? And men, we don't talk a lot, but we soak it a lot in our hearts. It's time to forgive. Let's pray. Let's stand on our feet, please. I don't know who you need to forgive today. I don't know how you have to forgive yourself. But the first journey in this teaching, some of you, 
the marriage you just do better if you just choose to forgive. Let's go ahead and forgive. Let's go ahead right now. Let's go ahead and forgive. Let's go ahead and forgive. Pray for that strength. Pray for that grace. Let's go ahead and forgive. And Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We receive it with gratitude today. We receive and make the decision to forgive. Thank you because your spirit has made it easy for us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Were you blessed? Look at him and say, what do you need to forgive? God bless you. You can have your seats.